thanks a lot for that, guys. Thanks a lot for spending your Saturday, uh, your, not, not Saturday, I'm, I think it's Saturday, your Thursday evening with us. Um, we hope you're enjoying it. And uh, we're just leaving you with the last plenary session of today. And uh, yeah, there you go. Over to you, Chris. That, that was great. I like that one. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be back. Thank you for the, the APAC team for getting me back. I think it's nearly 10 years since I've been since I've been over with you guys and had a lot of fun. Maybe up in room 112. I think that was my favourite room out into the foyer. Uh, right and uh, the first room there. Um, I could say uh, I, I could say hello, um, or I could say hello because I think this is how most of us are teaching uh, at the moment. Um, and if you're teaching like this, it's really quite difficult to convey how you're feeling to uh, you know to your class. So um, one little solution that a colleague of mine. Um, Jude McGovern here at Ellie came up with was this. <laughs> now you can see that I'm happy. And, uh, and equally, if I'm not happy, uh, you know, now you know that oh, the teacher isn't so happy. So I think a nice little way to convey moods, um, especially, especially to the primary students. Um, and we've got full face masks as well. So something like that to show that we're really happy. And if you've got a few students that happen to be online at the same time as you're teaching, you know, you can show them a happy face while you're taking, uh, you know, taking answers from the others. Um, equally, you know, not so happy. We could even put eye holes in there. Um, so I'm gonna get rid of this. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some ideas for primary. I'm going to show you some ideas for secondary. Uh, then I'll take questions for a few minutes. And by the end of it, hopefully you've all got some ideas you can take away um, with which to engage your students more. So um, showing your mood. That was for the people who've just arrived. That was this. <laughs> um, and, uh, and this one. Um, if, like me, you, you, you're having to zap students with these, if you told me that I'd be pointing guns at little kids in 2021, I uh, never would have imagined it. But uh, if you are having to take temperatures and you've got your primary kids outside, um, then why not take their temperature, zap them, and then spin it round and ask them to tell you, teacher, 36.3 degrees. Um, so we're getting a little bit of language out there. I've noticed a lot of my six, seven, eight-year-olds, um, you know, they think they, they were starting off thinking 30 was 40. In fact, 40 was always calling them. Um, so, and also the point rather than dot. So we start the day off practicing a little bit. Um, you might also be putting gel on kids' hands. Um, and, um, I think, again, we, you know, we can turn that into a little bit of fun. So we've got occasionally you see these sort of, you know, scented gels in places. I think this one's pineapple. Um, this one's Coca-Cola. Um, so we take out a mystery gel occasionally. I know we can't be buying gel all the time, but just occasionally it makes a nice change from the industrial stuff that we have in our institutions. So we go out, we give them all a, a squeeze of gel, and then we come in and we make a prediction. We go around the class, teacher. I think it smells of, and we get to guess. Um, this one was actually coconut. Um, now, as we go around, they, you know, primary kids, and you can see I've color coded, so that the first set of slides is for primary with the P, later it'll switch to a green S for secondary. Um, a lot of the time they'll repeat, so they'll hear their friend, I think it smells of coconut. And they oh, well, I want to change. And you've gone round. Now, there is something inside us thinks, oh God, do they want to change? But actually, that is beautiful because as I always say, when the uh, enthusiasm is with the students, we are controlling, we, the, the reins are with us. So it's like, you want to change your mind now? Okay, you can, but you have to say, teacher, I've changed my mind, can I switch? And they will do that because they want to switch. So we're using their enthusiasm to drive the language. Um, so we're seizing the moment, these bizarre COVID moments, 
to just include a little bit of extra language. You know, I think it smells of, or, um, you know, 36.3 degrees. Okay, um, I'm just gonna ask you to mute your mics for a second because we're getting some background noise there. Thank you very much. Okay, how old are you? Our kids have heard this time and time and time and time again. How old are you? How old are you? They must get bored of that. How old are you? How old am I? That's much more interesting. Ask your primary, primary teachers amongst you. Ask your students on Monday uh, or tomorrow. Ask them that to tell them how old you are, if you dare. <laughs> and it's quite interesting because, I mean, you get all sorts, you know. I think you are, I, I think you are 79. Um, I had one little boy, little David, he said, you know, I think you're seven. And his classmates looked at him and said, no, 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 him. How old do you think he is? And he looked at me, he said, yeah, yeah. I, he looked at them, he said, yeah, yeah, I think he's seven. I mean, he stuck to his guns, he did. Um, I think by the end of it, he was starting to, um, <laughs> oh, Josie, I don't dare. I think he was starting to, to waver a bit and think, you know, could he really be seven? Um, but we can practice loads of numbers there and I think it's a bit more interesting. So my idea here is that making a prediction is so much more fun than just being told what to say or do. So at primary level, we're, we're giving them the fuel for that prediction, creating the, the, the situation, and then they're getting to guess. And the, the, you know, the combinations and the options for us are, are myriad. Okay, again, with primary, we've got um, the core language is often presented you know, in each unit on page, sort of on the first or second page of the unit. Let's imagine that it's you know, 10 places in the town. Now, what I like to do is before we even get to that unit, we start playing about with the vocabulary. So um, we might be on a unit about food, but I'll already be introducing some vocabulary from the next unit. Let's imagine it's this. And the way we do it is uh, we just take two items, two or three weeks before we go on to the unit, and we say, kids, today we've got vocabulary wars. It is the street versus the supermarket. And then we go around the class and they need to tell us which one they prefer. So teacher, I prefer the supermarket. Bing, one point for the supermarket. But what will Fernando say? And Fernando says, I prefer the supermarket. Um, and then at the end of it, the winner advances to the next round. So today the winner was the supermarket. Next week, who will be the winner between? And then we give them two more options. Um, and vocab wars, I mean, you can do it with your flashcards on the board. You can do it with images. It's cheap, it's easy. Maybe it's even a little bit dirty, but it gets the language, you know, and we, we're getting full sentences rather than just looking at a flashcard and repeating one word. And again, the students will sometimes say, you know, quiero cambiar, it's like, okay, you can change. But you have to say, teacher, I've changed my mind. Can I switch? So again, we're using that enthusiasm to uh, to to get some language production. And sometimes you'll get when you do voting, you'll get a student. I mean, with your primary or your teens, but with the primary, when we're doing this sort of thing, you know, kid will sometimes say, you know, I don't want to vote, you know, uh, or I don't know. It's like, oh, no problem, you know. But in some ways, that's the easy way out. So what we say is, you know. Yeah, you don't have to vote, but you have to say, teacher, I'm not sure which one of them I prefer. That is a mighty long sentence. That's a glorious sentence. But if you're six or seven and you're faced with saying that, then maybe you think, oh, okay, well, maybe I will vote. <laughs> maybe I do have a preference now. So we give them the way out, but we make it you know, more effortsome than just voting. Either way, we're winners then. Attitude is what matters. Yeah, attitude is what matters. I, I agree with you there, Judith. Um, so, and then the next lesson. Now it is the bins and the bus stop. And then again, we go, we go around. This is another lesson. We just do two a lesson. Um, the principle here is very similar to the, to the last one. You know, expressing a preference, giving your opinion is also more fun than simply being told what to say. And you may have noticed, I mean, these, the, the pictures that I've used here, um, they're all pictures that I took myself. So um, 
It's not that I'm replacing the course book, but I'm complementing it. The thing is, I mean, you know, in the book, you might have a bus stop that might, might be a London bus stop. It might look totally different to the local bus stops. I mean, the taxis down here in Seville, they're, 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 they're white and green or white and yellow. I mean, the taxis up where you guys are, they're, they're black and yellow. They look totally different. So if you want your kids to be able to relate to the stuff, you know, have the, you know, instead of a deer there, it could be a, what is it, a caprabo is, is the one I think I used to shop at. Um, so that immediately they can relate to these things. And then sooner or later, you know, you're going to snap a street where, you know, where one of your students' uh, grandmothers lives. And, they, yeah, and every time you use that slide, you've got that extra engagement. Uh, so I think local is better. I mean, even if, if you took photographs around the school and showed them, you'd have your little kids standing up to tell you that they know where it is. Um, because it's, um, you know, it's that object shift at principle. It's things are more interesting slightly outside of their place than in their normal place. Especially imagine if you take pictures around the school and there happens to be a couple of their classmates. You know, you can see the backs of their classmates' heads behind a window or something. They're going to love it. They're going to be itching to tell you, you know, that's Pablito. And then you go, okay, but you have to say, teacher, I think that's Pablito, or I think I recognize Pablito. And boom, we've got that level of engagement. Okay, with the primary course books, uh, what I find these days is the, the, they're putting in these photo stories. They're like comics, but they often have, you know, photographs. Or sometimes they are comics as well. Um, and then in each box is some dialogue and the audio plays and it goes bing, and then it moves on to picture two and that. And uh, recently I've been working with some of these that were quite complicated. Nice, but quite complicated. The one I was working with recently was, um, uh, I think from New Tiger, uh, which is a Macmillan book. Um, and there was a new boy at school who went to school with his bag. In his bag was a recorder. He lost his bag, couldn't find his recorder. Two girls that are regular characters in the book found the bag, but then they talked about wanting to start playing music. They made a poster advertising a lost recorder. One of them starts playing the recorder and the boy hears it, follows the sound and finds his bag. I mean, so if you're sort of seven, that can be quite a tricky story to, you know, to follow at the same time as the audio's going, you're trying to figure out which of these little, you know, um, sandwich bubble things is, uh, is, the, is the first to speak in each box. So what I like to do is I storyboard the whole thing first as a step-by-step -step dictation. Um, I don't even tell them about the story in the book. So I just say, guys, here's a piece of paper, like this, no, like this, yeah? Like this, no, like this, like this, no, teacher, like this, yeah. Number one, and then we do number one. And I, I do a little picture of the, you know, I did a little picture of the school, and I wrote, today is the first day of school, and then they copy. And while they're doing this, it gives the teacher time to go around, concept check, you know. So what is the first day of school, you know? What does today mean? Is today the first day of your school, etc.? And then we go around, we do a brick wall. This is just an example. I'm doing it on the board, and I also do it on a piece of paper at the same time, so the kids can see where things are positioned on the piece of paper. Um, and, you know, you can see here in this one, I had the girls find the bag. And then one of the girls plays the recorder. And they're getting the basic schema of the, of the story. And then the new boy's sad, where's my recorder? And then they give him the recorder. My, my pictures don't normally work out so well, but you can see in this top corner as well that um, there, there is, I'm doing it twice, just so they can see the relative size of everything. Um, and then they read it to each other. They're getting some practice. And then we leave it. Two weeks later, we start the next unit. And suddenly, you, you know, one of them says, oh, this is like that other thing. It's like, yeah, it is like that other thing. And they have the basic schema, they're orientated, and immediately they, 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 know what's, they know what's what in this story. So I think this is the way to engage them with the stories. This is a point of entry. And I've been doing this with, with various stories. Uh, and I recommend you do too. Um, before I do that, what I'll often do is just sketch out roughly how it's going to look myself. So I've got my staging, maybe on a serviette in the cafe, 
before while I'm eating while I'm eating lunch or something like that. Okay, so we're providing entry points into the course book material. That's the principle at work there. This one is um, it's a classic. I've been using it for 20 years. A friend, Terry Ware at Ellie, when I started, taught me this one. Um, and, that, and you may have used it before, but you may have forgotten about it. So we've got a basic three in the row game. Uh, and the students, it's like tic-tac-toe. Um, and the students are telling us which square they want us to put their team symbol in. And the way they do that is by using the coordinates. So they have to join these. So, you know, if we wanted to put our heart here, we'd have to say, I've got ICT at half past 12. And so we've got the target language divided into two halves and they're all having to produce it by saying it to get their symbol in the square. So this is the manual way. Um, there I am in all my glorious fatness teaching. Um, the pictures are normally blurred because it's normally a student taking them. Um, and, that, and this is what I'll use if I've got time to knock it out on a projector, then I'll use it as a PowerPoint either in the class or it also works online. Um, and this is an animal one. Uh, so, you know, let's imagine we have two teams. So the circles, a cat, hasn't got claws, a cat has got claws. Okay, so you get your circle there. The next one over here, the other team chooses a teacher, uh, hasn't got a shell, hasn't got a shell, but over this last six or nine months, if we did have, some of us might have tried to crawl into those shells, eh? Uh, and we keep going, you know, the, the two teams, until somebody gets their three, then it's, for the circles we put that up there in the corner but it's not over then that's the important thing there's so much more mileage we keep going that's just one point so these guys get a point Ooh, boy, I got one point for the for the crosses and then if they get another here they get another point they can just keep on getting more points by adding um and that and um, this has been working a treat for me all this year. I've used it with the animals. Uh, great game, you forgot about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, totally. I forgot about it for about, um, for about 10 years, Magda, and then came back to it, desperate times, eh? Uh, it works with, the, it works with the, um, the facial features, the hair and that. Um, and it works with the times and the subjects. And uh, also, if I can just point your attention to the way I've done the times, so you can see there is progression. It's 10, quarter past 10, half past 10, and you can see we're working down. So a lot of the time we just throw random times at them and it confuses them. So at least there they can see there is some sort of progression, I think. So um, these are games that they can play, but they don't involve much movement. So we're not breaking any of our COVID uh, requirements. This one I like very much. I started this when I was teaching online, but I still use this in, in um, uh, socially distanced classes. Again, with primary, so I'll start with Alejandro. I'll say, Alejandro, tell me, you know, go up, go down, go left, go right. Alejandro says, uh, go up. So, all right, go, go left, go left, go left, go left, that one. And then I circle that one and that's Alejandro's emoji. And I say, Carmen Sita, tell me. And Carmen says, go down. I was like, okay, go down, go left, go left. She says, that one. And then that's Carmen's emoji. Um, then I'll save. So if this is projected up, I'll take a photo or I'll do a screen print. And then they've got their favorite emojis. These emojis actually come from Segoy UI symbol, which is, um, it comes free with uh, the Microsoft Word, I think. Um, and that. so you've got all the symbols there anyway. Uh, if you type them into a Word document, then they come out in color. If you type them straight into a PowerPoint, they can come out in black and white. And then in, in the future, if we're making a worksheet and we want to personalize it, we can put Alejandro's whale next to Alejandro. We can put Carmen's snowman next to Carmen when we put her name there. But the, the most value I think this has is it actually helps them orientate, it helps them direct the teacher. So for example, if you're using a classroom management uh, app like Class Dojo um, or um, uh, Class One, Two, Three, 
and they're changing their avatars. They're changing the little avatar that represents them. They don't have to leave their place. They can stay in their place. The teacher can put their cursor on and they can say, teacher, go up, go up, go left. And we've got it and we've given them a transferable skill. If we're playing the one, two, three in a row game and we can't hear what they're saying, you know, <laughs> so, oh, I can't hear if you're saying, she's got, a, he's got, go up, go up. And I've had them actually compensate and give me directions to the square they want um, using these. So we're enabling them to direct somebody on a screen remotely, which, you know, as you know from your, um, you know, your Zoom experiences and online platforms, we've had to do sometimes. Um, by doing this, I usually play just three in a row using this game online, but doing this at the blackboard can surely be uh, more interactive this way. I've, sometimes, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I like it both ways. Um, I mean, yeah, but yeah, for sure. So uh, give me a point, teacher. I mean, we deal in points sometimes. Some, some of us don't like points. I, I've stopped giving points. I've given my students a house. <laughs> so they, they each get a house on the, board, on the, on the wall. Um, and instead of giving them points each lesson, if they've done well, which, you know, I make sure they've all done well by the end, uh, they get um, something to go in their house. So one day it's, you know, can I have a sofa for my house? It's like, yes, you can. And the sofa goes under their house. Can I have a bicycle for my house? Yes, you can. And we're building this up over the term. Can I have a, a flat screen TV for my house? So, yeah, you can. I've actually just um, uh, 30 minutes ago finished a class with seven year olds. And in that class we did, uh, can I have a puppy for my house? Um, so now I've got to go through to the other room after this and you know, stick the puppies on. Uh, and one of them said, can I have two puppies? I was like, can you have two puppies? <laughs> yes, you can. But you have to say, type, 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 up on the screen, can I have another puppy for my house? Rock and roll, we've just taught another. Uh, and then next lesson, I've got the cats. And uh, in about a um, couple of months time, when they've got loads of things, then each of them can have their house, they can color it, they can decorate the rooms, uh, and then we'll probably laminate each of their houses so they can keep it. Um, so that's just an alternative reward, but something that they can accumulate over time, um, and that rather than just stickers on a chart. Uh, okay, a couple more primary, then I'm gonna move on to, uh, to, to give you guys some stuff um, for secondary. So I've been using um, video instructions increasingly um, over the um, over the over well over the last year or two or three. Um, the first time I read about it was in a book by Sue Cowley, a small manual called "The Seven T's of Differentiation." Um, uh, seven T's of Differentiation by Sue. Cowley, uh, that's, that's a nice little book uh, with quite a packed full of ideas. Um, and um, the thing is, if you give, if you have yourself giving instructions um, on the board, it, you can have a little rest and you can just make sure that they're listening to, you know, the other you. And, and, and then you can concentrate on who is listening, who isn't, who's understanding. Um, so this was me showing them how to draw faces on, on some dried beans. And we'd done a little dictation in the classroom. The activity itself isn't um, quintessentially important. The idea I'm trying to get across is the, use, the usefulness of doing these sort of quick presentations. But the activity is in uh, the Structuring Fun book that I've written. I'll show you that at the end if anybody's interested. Um, so I'd, I'd been in another room an hour before I'd recorded myself. And if you're doing recorded instructions for little kids, just make sure you say all their names at the beginning. You know, hello, Fernando, hello, Javier, hello, Carmen. And you can just see them in the class going, hey, you know. Again, it's that, it's, there shouldn't be anything surprising about the teacher saying their name, but the fact that it's you up there saying their name does make a difference. And then, you know, we can give them demonstrations. If they're not sure what to do, we can play that again while we're looking after the rest of them. 
These were my socially distanced, sterilized bags with dried beans and blue tack and a, and a template there. And so they, they colored in the haunted house template and the little beans and that. But uh, yes, yeah, so I'm using these instructions more and more. I've not got a clock here. Could, could I ask someone just to type in the current time for me, just so I can keep an eye on uh, how much we get through? 1926, thank you, Claudia. Okay, so we're using video to compensate for the restricted teacher mobility. We can't be moving over and looking at everything they're doing um, close up. So by having that at the front, you know, they've still got the demonstration. And it's easier when we make the recording to show them little stuff. Imagine if I wanted to show that to every student in the class. I'd have to walk around the whole class. Okay, and uh, you know, just occasionally, you know, we can, we can be a little bit daft as well. So um, just, I like to drop a silly face in there in my PowerPoint presentations uh, now and again, just to lighten the mood. All right, let me show you some stuff uh, I've been doing with Teams. So with all that's going on, you know, with all the, the you know, P PC tests, PCR tests, do they call them, and that, with all the different measures, with all the changes to, to classes and stuff, um, students can, they can come in quite decentered. So the first thing I like to do is, you know, just, you know, center ourselves a little bit and ask people, guys, you know, what was the last thing we did in the book? What was the thing before that? And what were these things meant to teach us? Just to find us and remind ourselves what we were doing before we, before we start the lesson. So sometimes, you know, I had a student tell me that they had, teacher, I have no idea what the last thing we did in the book was. I have no idea what we did last lesson. It's like, can I have a look? It's like, yes, please have a look. So we're just finding where we are before we move on. Because if we can't remember what we did last time, maybe there's not a lot of point in doing anything different. We could just go in circles like Groundhog Day. Um, so another one I like to use is this. Now we can put these questions on the board. We can hand them out as, you know, have them as little slips of paper as they, as they come in on their tables. Um, either way, some, you know, they work the same. Um, if you, Anna, if you make a fool of yourself, they won't be afraid of making a fool of themselves either. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a problem with that. It's, it's fairly clear that, you know, there is a high tolerance for um, foolery <laughs> in my lessons. But the other thing is, though, that we need to remember is, you know, we bring the chaos. The teacher brings the chaos, you know. So we joke when the teacher jokes, you know, and the students take the teacher's cue. So that's one of my mottos, I bring the chaos. Um, so this is one answer, uh, a student, you know, the last two homework were an audio reading. So, okay. Even there, there's language stuff, you know. So what I'll do is I'll get them to fill in and then I'll just ask two or three students, you know, tell me what you wrote, tell me what you wrote, tell me what you wrote. Three students, you know, it might be representative of 30. We don't have to take, you know, not everybody has to read everything out. Um, but uh, it's better if at least some students do. So we get that. And that's some language work, you know, so, you know it's actually, you know, um, it's, it's not homework, it's homework assignments. You know, we can give them a little bit of advice, a redaction. I know what you're trying to say, but, you know. And, I had a, and then the same student, they wrote this, you know, I forgot the audio. So when we finish the class, I'll do it. I said, that's lovely. That gives me a warm feeling. So we're just reminding ourselves of what we're doing and why we're there. I call these sharpeners. You know, sharpeners is sort of colloquial for, for those of you who don't know, is, you know, a little drink to, you know, sharpen you a bit. Um, not, probably not coffee. Um, but this just at the beginning of the class, I just use them occasionally, but it just gets everybody on point. What's the next thing we're going to use in the book? You know, uh, we're going to do in the book. What do you think that will be? I had a very interesting student said, you know, it's not going to be the next page, teacher, because I think you're going to miss that out. It's like, yes, I am. Why? And then they said, yeah, because it looks like this really dry reading and that. Um, the other one, what's the last word you wrote in your English notebook? Um, you know, the answer to this might be, teacher, I haven't got a notebook at the moment. Fine, but at least we know where we are. Um, I've done a few of these. I think I've done a set of 10. If anybody's interested, send me an email and specify, you know, I like those little slips and uh, then, I'll, then I'll send you a copy. So we're just reconnecting with what we're doing uh, and where we are and why. 
I've been having a lot of fun with the um, uh, Snap Camera app. So, I mean, my actual mobile is, is prehistoric, but I downloaded, it's called Snap Camera, and I downloaded it to my laptop, this thing that I'm doing the session from. Um, and what you can do is you can superimpose, superimpose strange faces over your own. And so in the lead up to our mid-course exams, each lesson, um, I will play them a short video, and it's me reading from the book. Right, so dictation, there's 12 items, number one. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is a glass container that you would put food in, possibly chickpeas or jam. And then I'll wait, I might tell them, you know, it begins with J. And then I pause, they're in the classroom, they're writing it. I'm in the class watching myself, but I'm just, it gives me downtime as well. And, um, and then at the end, on the recording, on the same recording, we give them the answers as well. So you've got this self-contained dictation, just like you do a dictation in class. It doesn't have to be with a silly Snapchat filter face. That's just for novelty. But the fact that you have this set piece means that you can relax a little bit and just let the other you do the work. You're spreading your workload out over the day. And in fact, my centre director is very kindly teaching my team's class, which I would normally be teaching right now. And I believe she's playing probably the ghost one to them at this moment. So very nice for recording uh, vocabulary. If you think that, you know, the, your students seeing you with purple lips and, and lashes or transformed into a, a, a goat or a cat, will undermine your teacher um, persona, then don't do it. I mean, you know, I have classes like that, that if I'm struggling with silliness, I won't in introduce more silliness. Um, but these, these have been serving me quite nicely. Just remember, if you do download the um, Snap Camera app, um, to take it, make your recordings, then take it off your laptop before you start doing a Zoom conference. Because I found that sometimes you can't get it off and you don't want to be giving your Zoom meeting or attending it, you know, with rabbit ears, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Okay, can I ask the, the time again um, from some kind soul? Is it Claudia that typed it in last time? Uh, 1933, 1933, thanks. Oh, brilliant. You guys are fast on the chat box, that's glorious. Um, okay, so what we're doing with this is we're just making, it's what Kerry Jones, um, the materials and course book writer uh, and, and friend said uh, years ago, um, she said, we're making the familiar unfamiliar. So this is, this is a dictation, de toda la vida, except, you know, the teacher is, you know, half a vampire or a jellyfish ghost with, you know, headphones. Um, I used to, um, so when I left Barcelona in about 210, 211, um, I, I moved to Cadiz, then I moved to Seville and I started growing um, my own chili plants. In Barcelona, it was the, I think it was the Bangladeshi shops used to have loads of chilies. There was no need, I could get chilies easily. Um, but in Seville, I couldn't get the chilies I wanted. So I started growing them. Uh, and for many years, had a lot of fun. Some of you may have been to conferences where I've been you know, handing out chilies or chili related products occasionally. I think I did that with a few IH conference uh, uh, sessions. This was, I used to collect them by the, you know, top load and I'd take them into class. We'd have chili sampling. Uh, these are some uh, chili sauces I used to cook up um, and I'd take in little bottles of chili puree and we'd have a lot of fun. It was, it was great fun to mother. Um, Obviously, all that's gone at the moment. You know, we're not really, they're not really even meant to come to the front, are they? So uh, to replace that, what I've started doing is a series of little vlogs, you know, video, you know, diaries. So I've been showing them how my chilies this year have been growing. You can see from seedling to slightly bigger. And this was this last weekend where I was out um, replanting them from the original Tupperware um, to the little pots. And I started this, it, it could, yeah, like a biology lesson. Yeah, totally like a biology lesson, Pavia. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and I actually, I did a, like an unboxing. The original, the first recording was, you know, when the 
envelope arrived from Juka, who is at uh, Fatali Seeds in uh, Finland. He's my he's the person, the website I buy the the seeds off. I did change the address. I called myself, you know, I didn't I didn't think they needed to see my address on the on the on the thing. But I took out the seeds. I explained and I turned it into a listening. So they had question, you know, and these are the questions from my own narrative. And it's really easy to turn your own narrative into questions. Because, you know, A, you know the answers. And then B, when you're helping them find the answers, um, when you're helping them listen to the answers within the stream of speech, as, as Richard Caldwell would call it, you know your speech very well. So it's very easy to clear up things or, or you know, help. Can you hear how I say that? Can you hear that bit? There were actually 14 questions in the first video, so. Um, like teaching history while making you appear like a historic well-known character while speaking English, for example. Yeah, that would work out here, that would be nice. Um, now, you don't have to plant um, chilies, but we're all doing stuff. You might be doing up your, um, you know, you might be doing up your bathroom, retiling your bathroom, preparing a new room for, uh, uh, you know, a new addition to the family. You might be crocheting, um, uh, a large blanket, you might be cooking, you might be doing up a piece of furniture, building a motorbike. Um, we're all doing stuff all the time, uh, which we can turn into little little video, uh, video logs like that. So we're compensating for the lack of interaction by taking it out and bringing it into the class. Um, and another thing, I, you know, I think sometimes we ask our students, tell me about this, you know, tell me about your life, you know, write about your hobbies. But I think we have to give a response to get a response. We have to give a little bit of ourselves, you know, uh, in order to get something back from the students. Um, you know, you may not want your students to know everything about your life and that's perfectly fine. Um, but just giving them an insight that you are more than just the person that mediates, you know, exercise, 3A on page 37, three times a week, you know, has value, I think. Um, okay, so the, the difficulty at the moment, we've got some students at home some of the time, we've got some students in the classroom, um, and I've noticed my, the, the written work I'm doing is coming at me in a variety of formats. So the solution is something that I first came across um, 10, 10, 12 years ago in an old copy of EL, the ELT journal 44. And this is one of my, I mean, one of the, probably one of the most important articles for my teaching. And Ken Highland was recommending in this that when students give us their writing, um, instead of correcting it on the page, we pop in a cassette, we press record and we record ourselves giving them feedback to the writing. And on the actual writing, all we do is we just put, you know, 1, 2, point 2, point 3, point 4, point 5. Then we give them the cassette and the piece of paper that they've written on. They go home and listen to it. And they get a free listening and they get their, um, their feedback. Now, I did that at the time and I did it on cassettes and it took a terribly long time and I had to have a cassette for every student. And then, and you know, then we got CDs and we couldn't do anything with the CDs, but then the internet and technology evolved and now we can do audio files easy. So whatever homework comes in, whatever format it's in, I just start reading it, I, I, you know, open up my voice recorder, click and start reading it and start correcting. Um, so, you know, click, okay, so Paola, let's have a look at what you've written and I'll start reading it and correcting. And I won't even mark up the manuscript now. I'll just send her back the audio file and she can do the rewrites by listening to it. And she can listen to it many times because, so, and that means that I can speak at my natural speed. Now, sometimes teachers say to me, yeah, but I'm not so confident that I can correct everything in the moment well you don't have to be because the voice recorders have a pause button so if you need to think if you think oh just press pause 
then you have a think about the error, then you start it again and say, so what I think you probably need to do with this sentence. My own recorded feedback is often very confused, very, you know, I mean, it takes quite a lot of listening to, but then they have to listen to it to do the rewrite and, and their English will not evolves. Um, can I have another time check, Claudia? 41, fantastic, thank you. Which voice recorder do I use? Suzanne, I use this one here. This is, it says just voice recorder and it comes, I think it came free on this uh, Lenovo ThinkPad. So yeah, I used to use Vocaroo then, I mean, now all the computers have a voice recorder. So, and it's simple, simple, send it back as a, as a, um, an audio file. Um, now, I know that some of you guys have got classes with more students than my classes. At the moment, I have 12 students in a class. I know you've got bigger classes. So, does it, is it quicker? And the thing is, I hand on heart believe that it is quicker. So I did a time trial. I sat down and this one, I actually had the, um, the pieces of paper. I had physical you know, um, assignments and I started and I saw, I, I thought, right, how many of these can I do in an hour? And these were um, upper intermediate and advanced level writings. That means they were long. And I did 18 in one hour. And I don't always do them as video. You know, but I did these just for the purpose of really display. But 18 in an hour is no slower than I go when I'm marking. If I'm marking full belt with loads of coffee, I'm not going faster than that because you have to kind of figure out what you're putting on the page, where it's going, and you've got limited space when you're writing. When you're speaking, it's limitless, as you can see, by the way, I'm motoring on here. So it's very, very nice. I recommend you try the system if you haven't already. I believe it will revolutionize how you do your marking. Uh, and, and like I say, now I'm, I'm just correcting them with pure audios. I'm not even touching the manuscripts. Rock and roll. Sounds good. Thanks, Patricia. So we're giving a response to get a response. They're getting there. They're getting, you know, personalized response to the, you know, rather than just the graffiti that they probably perceive normally. Okay, next idea, a bit more silliness. Um, <laughs> I had this on my table. Someone said, teacher, what's that? Why is that upside down? I said, I don't know. It's been upside down like that since I came in. So the cleaner must have put it there. I said, why don't you lift it up? You know, so she did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these little plastic cockroaches, they're great. I mean, especially if you put them in the shadows um, where they're less obvious. And that, but if you do that, you cannot be the first person to see it because if you're the person to point it out, then they'll know it's you. So you have to wait till the student sees it. Um, but you can provide the strongest reaction. You know, somebody saw one and I go, ah, I jumped up onto a chair. I shouted, Paula, kill it, kill it, Paula. I'd left a brush in the corner as well. There was Paula trying to kill the plastic cockroach. These might be just, you know, small moments. But, you know, if you've done five classes already, with a blooming mask on. <laughs> Just something like that can change your day, I think. Welcome to my little friends. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm gonna be pranking my students with a whole range of things um, over the next month or two. Like I say, it's planned disruption. We bring the chaos. Uh, okay, for using longer documentaries in class, this is a system that I've been using recently and it's been, it, it's been working very, very nicely. So I said, guys, we're gonna watch this. We're gonna watch five minutes of this clip. During that five minutes, I'm gonna give you a post-it note and you can make a few notes, just a few on what you see, but I want you to spend most of the time looking and listening. After the five minutes, you're gonna get another five minutes to write a four sentence summary of those five minutes, just four things you saw. And then we're gonna play the clip for another five minutes. Then we stop, you get another five minutes to write another four sentences on the previous five minutes. So we're building up this summary in four or five sentence increments as we watch. 
and you know, while they're writing, they can ask the teacher to help them to point things out, etc. At the end of it, you've got, you know, you've got a full page of writing. We've turned that clip from input into output, and we've kept them focused on a clip that is not just a, a pop clip or a music clip. Um, this was a this was a clip about. Uh, recycling in a, a Coptic Christian um, community that recycles rubbish in in, uh, in Egypt. But I'm not recommending the clip per se. I'm recommending the, the, the system. Five minutes clip, five minutes write-up. Five minutes clip, five minutes write-up. Small amounts of writing that don't hurt, but by the end of it, you've got something of beauty. Okay, I'm coming to the end. I've got a, um, so we've got sort of guided structure um, and we've got input into our I'm coming to the end, but um, I think I've got, oh, I have come to the end, blow me down. And I think I might be on time. So um, there's my Facebook. If we're not friends, uh, maybe we should be. Um, it's Chris G. Rowland. Um, my email has, you're very welcome, Noelia. Um, my email has um, changed. It used to be a British council when I was up in Barcelona. Uh, now it's this one. By all means, get in touch. Um, you might want to take a screen print there, but it'll also be on the recording. Um, people said to me before, they said, Christopher, you should write a book. I said, yeah, that's a good idea, but I haven't got an editorial. Now I've got one, so I thought I'd write three. So we've got two big books, which are the teens and the structuring ones. And you can see these are nice, That you know, there's quite a lot in them. I'm quite really rather proud of these. And we've even got color pictures in the primary one as well, which is nice. And recently I've written this, this little mini book uh, on uh, online teaching, which I'm quite happy with as well. But they're from Pavilion. Um, and that is the Pavilion um, newsletter um, address. They've just put books on Kindle as well. And there are, there are some really good authors uh, at the moment penning new volumes as well. Right, my friends, I might have a couple of minutes for questions if there are any. Um, so uh, I shall be looking at the chat box here. I bring the chaos. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have got planned to do a session actually entitled that, but I think it's important. I mean, I've, you know, I brought in one of these pooters that made the kind of farting sound. You have to be careful with that, you know, which class you use it with. But again, it's I bring the chaos. You don't want your kids later doing <coughs> blowing raspberries for 30 minutes. It's like, no. I bring the joke and then we settle down again. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, it was weird not to hear anybody laughing. Mm. <laughs> bizarre at this point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's, I mean, it's, it's nice to have the chat box up at the same time and because yeah. you, you, you get that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It was a great way to end the day. <laughs> um, I don't know, does anybody? Uh, have any question or comment? Uh, thanks, Montserrat. Mm, thanks, Judith. I think you could make t-shirts. You've had like great slogans that would work well. <laughs> yeah, do you know, I, I, yeah, I think, yeah, I've, I've had a few t-shirts. We've done a few. Actually, there was a, a friend in Russia who did one. Um, can there be chaos without chaos? I think there probably can. Um, can I? Yeah, I think there probably can. But, um, you know, um, yeah, clinical chaos. There was somebody in Russia, a friend of mine, Ray Carlin, he actually did some, he did some um, t-shirts with my face on, but it was so realistic. He put rock and Roland on them. It was so realistic that when you wore the t-shirt, um, if you moved, the face changed expression. So it was, uh, it was, it was quite disconcerting. Yeah. <laughs> Any warm up or icebreaker that you could use with adults? Um, okay. Adults, 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 adults. I have an adult and an adult class at the moment amongst all the teens and, and uh, little. What do I do? I mean, I think um, the, the socially distanced adult classes I'm teaching are very different to the classes I was, adult classes I was teaching, um, you know, the summer before last, where I was going around and personalizing the whole thing. But I think maybe the important thing is that to touch base with them as people. So the first thing, you know, what have you eaten today? I mean, just basic stuff or um, um, 
to connect with them as people. There is actually one activity that I do that I like. Um, so what I do is I give them a breakdown by percentage of my previous week. So for instance, I'll say, you know, I spent 20% of the time uh, sleeping. I spent 20% uh, of the time, um, let's imagine it was Easter holidays, watching Netflix. Um, I spent 5% of the time thinking about taking the rubbish out. I spent 1% of the time actually taking the rubbish out, etc. And And it all has to add up to 100%. And then we ask them, can you can you do a breakdown by percentage of you know last week or the weekend? Um, and we can use that as an entry point into discussion about what they've been doing because normally you'll see something that you can pull out to ask them as a, a follow-up question. Don't know how useful that is, but um, you know the activity itself is quite sweet. Works with teams as well, and you know, on various levels, you just ask them for longer or, or you know shorter uh, answers. The important message here is the, the social component and the fun and the vibes. I think that the same vibes you convey, the really good vibes and the, I mean, there's this cool atmosphere that makes you want to come back is I think what we'll be leaving with. And it's great that we could end on such a high note because let's face it, it's Thursday yeah. evening. Oh, it's, man, that's great. Like seven o'clock if you're in London, like Angels. But um, still... I mean, this, this was the end of our day. And I think we need to remember that for students, it might be tiring to have one class after the other. So this fun component and the social component and this caring component in the end, because in the end is relating to the students, let them be adults, teenagers or kids, as people, as people who have feelings, who have, I mean, stuff going on in their lives. I think that's that's the, the, the most essential thing. So I, I want to thank you personally, because I mean, I had such a laugh. It, it was lucky that my mic was muted because like, Angels was saying, I think a lot of people had a laugh here. Oh, brilliant. That's magic. Strength and energy, everybody. And, and I wish you all in the weeks and months going forward. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Bye.